Good morning, and welcome to Mass Memorial CME Sunday School for July 17th, 2022, and this is Sister Sharon. We are in our summer quarter, Partners in a New Creation, Unit 2, The Word, The Agent of Creation. Our lesson today, The Word Resurrects the Dead. Just as a reminder, one of the verses we've already studied, John, the first chapter, the first verse says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then our key verse for today comes from John, the 11th chapter, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And our lesson scripture that's printed is John the 11th chapter, verses 17 through 27 and verses 38 through 44. Let's look at our background. So every week for the last few weeks, I've been talking about John. So this time I'm gonna talk a little bit shorter about John, but give you some more details still from the book of John. So talking about John the apostle, Jesus called him and his brother James, sons of thunder. He called himself the disciple Jesus loves. He was part of Jesus' inner circle, which was Peter, James, and John. He has been called the apostle of love. He's also a spiritual father because he uses that phrase, little children, in his writing. And he wrote the Gospel of John, which we're studying, in three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, in the book of John, or in the Gospel of John, he uses the word signs. And John, John uses the word signs to acknowledge miracles that unveil the glory and power of God through Jesus Christ. So some theologians say that there are seven of them. Some people say there's eight. You can almost even count that there's nine, but I'm just gonna list them for you. And so these signs that are in the gospel of John, because you'll see, um, remember John is not synoptic. So what John has sometimes is not in Matthew, Mark or Luke or Matthew, Mark and Luke seem to kind of cover the same topics. But this is what John covers. And remember, we talked about John covered certain things so that we would believe who Jesus is, that he is human and divine. So first, the first sign was um, Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana. That's John, the second chapter. Last week, we studied the healing, Jesus healing the nobleman's son in Capernaum. That's John, the fourth chapter. And John, the fifth chapter, Jesus um, heals a paralytic at Bethesda. And John, the sixth chapter, he feeds the 5,000 men. And we also remember women and children were also in that group. And then John, the sixth chapter also is walking on water. So some theologians put that together as one sign, even though it was two events, feeding the 5,000 and walking on water. Then there's also where Jesus healed the blind man from birth. That's in John 9. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That's today's lesson. That's John, the 11th chapter. And they say that that is the last miracle sign before Jesus' death and resurrection, okay? So that's the last one. So some people count that one as the seventh one, like it's the seventh sign, but it depends on the theologian. So again, uh, raising Lazarus from the dead was is John 11. Then Jesus' resurrection itself is John the 20th chapter, and that's a sign, that's a miracle that gives glory and power, shows the power and glory of God. And then Finally, there's the miraculous catch of fish in John 21, which was private. The other ones were public. All the other ones, there was a big audience. On the catching of fish, that was just, you know, a few of his disciples, and he revealed himself, but they had this miraculous catch of fish at the end. And so um, those are the signs in the Gospel of John. Now, today, again, we're going to be talking about when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And you might say, is that the only time Jesus read, raised someone from the dead? And it's not. So there are two additional accounts of Jesus raising people from the dead. You might remember the story of Jairus's daughter. It's in, the, it's in Mark 5. It's in the same chapter as the woman with the issue of blood. Okay. Um, remember, he was on his way to um, Jairus's house and the woman of the issue of blood touched his garment. He stopped. And then, you know, they had told him not to bother um, you know, his servants came and said, don't bother the teacher any longer. And teacher, and then Jesus told him, just believe. And they went and um, his daughter was resurrected. And then the other situation, there was, um, was the widow's son in Nain. He was on his way to Nain. He was right outside of it. They were carrying out her, her son. And remember, a widow depended on, um, or a woman depended on her spouse or her son 
um, to live back in those days. And so then she's a widow. So what that means, her, us, her husband had already died and now her son had died. And then Jesus um, resurrected her son. And that's in Luke, the seventh chapter. Now, the difference in these resurrections or the difference is the place because Jairus' daughter and the widow's son in name, that took place, place in the region of Galilee. And now he is in the region of Bethany, okay? So not the region of Bethany, but he's in Bethany. He's in the city of Bethany. And I'm gonna show you where Bethany really is, okay? It's located. And we're gonna talk about Bethany. So Bethany is a village on the road to Jericho near Southeast slope of the Mount of Olives, about two miles outside of Jerusalem. That's the difference. He's right by Jerusalem when we look at this resurrection of Lazarus, okay? The name Bethany actually means the house of unripe fig, okay? And then, but there's a modern Arabic name, which is El Azariah, which means home of Lazarus. And then this is also the place where Jesus ascended into heaven. And you can find that in Luke, the 24th chapter, the 50th and the 51st verse. So that's what Bethany means. So that Beth part means house, by the way. So when we see Bethel, that's house of God. Bethany means house of the unripe fig. So if you see a Beth in front, that means house of. So now let's look at our map. So when, so first we're gonna start by looking at the top of our map. When we look at our map and we see the region of Galilee right by the Sea of Galilee, you'll notice that you'll see um, Nain, okay? And you'll see Cana where he turned the water into wine. Okay, and you'll see Capernaum where he healed the nobleman's son. Okay, that's the region where Jairus's daughter was resurrection was resurrected, and that's also the region where the widow's son was resurrected. So that's where he was. Now let's look down. He is now all the way down. He's no longer in the region of Galilee. He's back around. Um, he's close to Bethlehem. He's close to Jerusalem. Okay, he's in the region of Judea. OK, and that's important that now, even though he had raised people from the dead in Galilee, now he's in the region of Judea. And in this in Jerusalem, remember, you've got the Pharisees, you've got the Pharisees. So you've got the Sanhedrin. You've got so you've got all the power brokers, if you want to say that, the political ones and the religious ones. And this Bethany is right outside of Jerusalem. So it's just two about two miles away right by the Mount of Olives. And that's where our lesson takes place. Now, I know the lesson says 17 to 27 and 38 to 44, but everybody, honestly, the story goes from verse one to verse 44. And in order to do the lesson, I have to do the entire lesson so you know what's going on. So we're gonna go through verses one through 44 today, okay? So a lot of scripture today. And this all deals with the raising of Lazarus. So I warned you. So I, I give you parts so you'll see before the lesson, middle of the lesson and so forth. But this is the part that comes right before the lesson. But it's still, we need this part for our lesson. So starting with John the 11th chapter verses one through three, it says, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany. We just talked about Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. So I call this relationship has privileges. Okay, Jesus had a relationship with Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. Many times when he was in Jerusalem, he actually did not stay in Jerusalem. He stayed in Bethany. He stayed at their home. And so even you might remember the story of when, when Jesus and all the disciples were at his home, at, were at their home and Mary was busy trying to serve them all. And, excuse me, Martha was busy trying to serve them all and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet and Martha was like, Jesus, could you ask her to help me? Okay, but see, this is a same, that same house, okay? So you've got Mary, you've got Martha and you've got Lazarus. And they say that Mary was the homeowner because it says it's her house. But all we know is these three siblings were in this house. And so then, um, and this is the same Mary, because, you know, we have a lot of people named Mary in the Bible, but this is the same Mary who have, 
took her anointed Jesus feet with the fragrant oil. So we talk about the alabaster box that was broken open and the expensive perfume was poured out on him and preparing him in a sense for his burial. And that she took this oil and um, anointed him and she wiped her feet, um, wiped his feet with her hair. This is that same Mary, okay, the same sister. And now Lazarus is sick. He's very sick. So because of relationship, okay, um, the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. So Jesus loves these people and they know it. So matter of fact, the other day I said to my uncle, he turned um, 88 and I said, I love you. He says, I know. And so they also knew that Jesus loved them. So when they sent this word, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But I have a couple of extra verses for you. Psalm 34, 15 says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. So they're crying out to the Lord. They're sending a message. So for us, um, we, not, we can't go physically to Jesus, but we can cry out to the Lord. And because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, he hears our cry. So he hears them and he, and he loves them and he loves us and he hears us. Then Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Okay, so Jesus understands. He's our high priest. And it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so that's what Mary and Martha are doing. They're coming boldly to Jesus. They're saying, they're, they're sending the people out ahead of them saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. You know, they think, in other words, we need you to get here. We need you to get here. So they're asking for mercy for him. They're asking for grace because this is a time of need. And so we need to also realize when we have a time of need to come boldly to the throne. Okay. We should come boldly anyway, just because he's God and we, we're his children and we want to uh, just love them and, and talk to them. But also when we have a time of need, we need to come boldly and we need to ask for mercy. And we also need God's grace. Okay. So then the next verse four says, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God may be glorified through it. So he's talking to his disciples who are with him at this time. And again, he's not in Bethany yet. And he's saying, he's explaining that even though um, Lazarus is sick, this is not this sickness is not for him to die. And I call this why, because a lot of times we want to know why somebody's sick. Sometimes it might be because um, we didn't take care of ourselves physically. Sometimes we blame it on sin. And that's what they did a lot of times biblically. Um, if someone was sick, they said, oh, they must have sinned in order to be sick. And sometimes people who live a hard life there's stuff that happens to their body, you know, too, too much alcohol, their liver is gone. Okay. It, you know, it's um cause and effect, you know, it, there is a consequence, wage of sin is death. So it's not that that's not the case, but every single sickness and everything that happens doesn't mean, you know, we want this cause and effect. We want the why, why? And sometimes we're not going to know the why, but Jesus told his disciples here, this sickness is not unto death. This sickness is to show God's glory. Okay. This is to, to um, pedestal God, to put him high, high and lifted up. This is to show the weight of his excellence. So that's why Lazarus is sick. So this is what he's telling his disciples, okay, that this sickness is not unto death. Okay. But that just for us to realize, sometimes we're not going to get a why. We have to trust God. We don't have the why. And then sometimes we're making up a why. It's not the answer. It's not because we did anything wrong. Might, we might have done nothing wrong. Okay. It, it's not because somebody else did something wrong. It might not be. Um, there are people, the, the man who wrote, I think the man who wrote the book on running actually died. You know what I mean? Um, even though he was healthy, you know, he appeared to be healthy. So Everybody, just be mindful about that why. We want to know why, why, why. And we and we want, we act like God has to explain himself. He's God. He doesn't have to explain himself. Okay. But in this situation, he goes ahead and he explains himself. He said, This is to give Father God glory. So then we look at verse five and five through seven. And it says, Now Jesus loved Martha 
and her sister and Lazarus. And this is the second time, remember, they knew it because right at the beginning, they said, Lazarus, who you love is sick. And now point blank is saying in verse five, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and, and Lazarus. He loved it, this family. He said, so now, okay, oh, he loves them. So when he heard that he was sick, so he heard Lazarus was sick and he said, come now, he didn't come. It says he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. So you might be going, why in the world? Now, remember, he already told the disciples, this sickness is not to death. This is to get for God to have glory. This is for God to be uplifted, for people to see God. But it's like, it starts off saying he loves them and then he didn't come. And so I call this look at circumstances through love, not love through circumstances. Sometimes we see something go wrong and then we say, God, you don't love me. See, we're blaming, we're saying God doesn't love us because something bad happened. Somebody died. We got sick. We didn't get the promotion. Something happened on our job. And because of that thing that happened, we act like God doesn't love us. But God does love us. So you look at circumstance, you look at circumstances through love. You start off with God loves me. I don't understand this situation, but God loves me. God knows the end from the beginning. You know, my steps are ordered by God. And it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, for God has a plan for us to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us a hope in the future. We have to remember who God is. So we look at our circumstances through love. We don't look at love through our circumstances. We don't look at our circumstances because in this world, you'll have tribulation. Jesus told us that. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So if we look at the tribulation, we're going to say, where's God? But he already said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's his love. And so then when we're going through something, we're also going through. We're not staying in. We're going through. So that means we look at the circumstances through love, not love through the circumstances. So in this situation, point blank, Jesus loved Martha. He loved Mary. He loved Lazarus. And then he did not get up and go right then. He stayed two more days where he was. You know, now he might have had something to finish up. But he also knew what was going to happen. And he waited. Let's look what happens. Oh, got another verse for you. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, and God is saying this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We keep trying to box God in. We keep trying to figure out God. We keep trying to say, this is why this happens. And that means we're trying to figure out God. God's thoughts are higher than ours. God's ways are higher than ours. Okay. And so, um, we can't figure him out. He's infinite. We're finite. Okay. But we go and we remember he loves us. Now, the next part I call to die for, because the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. And are you going there again? So we have to remember the Jews, the, the Pharisees, the Sadduce Sadducees, people in the Sanhedrin, they, and um, just some of the, the crowd, they wanted to kill Jesus. And so he's, so going to Jerusalem is not a safe place, okay? That is not the safe place to go for him. And so the disciples are reminding him, rabbi or teacher, um, you do remember these folk want to kill you. They want to stone you. And you're going to go there? And this, I called it to die for because Jesus was going. Okay, he might have delayed two days or he might have, okay, he might have delayed a couple of two days but he's willing to die to handle your situation. And he did die to handle our situation. So um, he died for it. So, you know, people say, oh, that's to die for. So that's what he thinks about us. Oh, we're to die for. And he did. He died for us. And so the disciples, they're not too comfortable with this because they're hanging out with him and they're going, I'm um, they're trying to kill you. And, you know, they might kill us too. You know what I mean? In a sense, but it's like, do you remember? And this is always funny trying to, um, and this comes up more than once in a lesson. When we try to explain stuff to God, when we're trying to remind God, okay, um, Jesus doesn't forget, okay? If he forgets something, he chooses to forget. He chooses to forget our sin, but he doesn't forget things. So they didn't have to remind him that people were trying to kill him. He knew people were trying to kill him. 
So then all of a sudden he starts telling this story about time and the day. And you go, what does that have to do with the fact that Jews are trying to kill him? So I call this to everything there's a season because Jesus, his answer was, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now I'm gonna stop there for a minute. He told this because what he's saying is in the 24 hour day, there are two time slots. There's the day, which is 12 hours and the night that's 12 hours. And those are set, they're set. So what he's trying to tell them is, my life is set. When I'm going to die is set. Okay. It's not going to surprise me. I'm not going to be caught off guard. I'm, it's not going to be before God's choosing. So he's saying like the day is set and the night is set. My life here is set. What I have to go through is set. And me going to see Lazarus and Mary and Martha is not going to make my death come faster. In other words, they're they not going to kill me while I'm at the house. Okay. It's going to set some things in motion, but it's, they're not going to kill me while I'm at their house. So I'm on my way. So then, then, okay. So verse 11 says, these things he said. And after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. So this is what he says to the disciples. Well, they're confused. So then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. Because, you know, we know a lot of times when we're not well, all we need to do is rest. OK, our bodies are worn out. We need to get rest. You know how they say drink fluids and get rest. And so the disciples are saying, oh, well, if he's sleeping, that's going to help him get well. And then but Jesus was actually talking about his death. But they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep, just regular rest. And you'll see all throughout the Bible, there are other places like when um, Stephen, who was martyred, um, and they stoned him, then it says, and he fell asleep. I, I love that because it's, it's just a peaceful idea. And then even a lot of times when you see, you go to the home going of, of someone who's a Christian, and you look at the body in the casket, they just look like peaceable sleep. They're just resting. It's just sweet sleep. And so he's just saying, oh, our friend Lazarus sleeps. Okay, and so, but they didn't get it. Okay, they didn't get it. So then Jesus had to, in verse 14, just point blank tell them because they weren't getting it. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. You know what I mean? Sometimes you try to soften the blow, but you know, it's like they didn't get it. You know, like we might say, um, someone has transitioned, they're gone home to be with the Lord, but sometimes you end up having to be blunt and say, so and so died. Lazarus is dead. That's what Jesus did. And then he goes and he says something like, huh? He says, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. And what I thought about when I read this was I thought about, and I don't know how you were raised and, you know, and I'm not trying to get everybody's um, view on this, but we had spankings, okay, and when we were growing up. And you know how they would say, um, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you or something like that. But I kind of thought about that. But I'm saying, or they'll say something like this line I have, this is for your own good. You'd be like, how is this for my good? <laughs> okay. And so he's saying, Lazarus dying is for your good. So him being dead, you know, um, he's not talking about the actual physical death, but that's good. He's saying, because of the miracle that I'm about to perform, this is going to strengthen your faith. OK, and so we need to remember God wants to strengthen our faith. God is concerned with our faith journey. We're concerned a lot of times with our circumstances, and what's going on. But God is concerned with how we are growing up in Christ and our faith journey. So he says, Lazarus dying and what is about to happen is going to help you in your faith journey. It's going to help you believe more. So he's saying to the disciples, this is for your own good. So then they're going to head to Bethany. And then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, I call this split personality, but only reason why I'm doing this is because Thomas normally gets a raw deal <laughs> when we talk about him. We always talk about him in terms of doubting Thomas. We talk about him after um, Jesus was crucified and he wasn't there when they saw him. And he says, unless I put my hands in his side and in, in, in the nail prints, then I'm not going to believe. We always talk about him in terms of that one event, but we skip this event. 
This is Thomas as well, the same Thomas. This is a Thomas that's so brave and so dedicated and so loyal to Jesus that he says, let us also go that we may die with him. So sometimes we have our mountaintop experiences, all of us, and sometimes we have our valley experiences. Sometimes, you know, we have our pity parties, you know, so, and sometimes we're in our praise God party. And so Thomas looks the same way. Here, he's bold, he's brave, he's loyal, and he's willing to die for Jesus. So let's not narrow Thomas down to one thing that he did wrong or one negative thing he said. And we do that with people. They say one thing, and then we say, well, that's how they are. We write them off. Don't write off Thomas. Look at what else Thomas did, okay? The twin Thomas. Look what else that he did, okay? Um, so the, I could say the Thor Thomas, you know what I mean? The idea that he was brave, he was loyal, he was believing, and he was ready to die for Jesus, okay? And so they, they're on their way to Bethany. Now, now the lesson begins, but see, we needed all that to get to the lesson. So then I call this OMW, okay? And so it says, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. So remember, Jesus got the message that Lazarus was sick, okay? And then he waited two more days. And by the time he had waited those two more days, Lazarus had been in that tomb for four days. And I call this OMW because, you know, a lot of times when we're texting and we're supposed to be someplace, we say OMW, we're on, which means on my way. And we laugh because um, even in the choir, um, you know, um, one of my uh, sons in the choir one used to say OMW and we'd be like, okay. And then even another one I know, I would say, is this a my OMW, which means I'm truly on my way, or is this a your on my way? And we would laugh because we would say their OMW means that they are putting on their coat or putting their clothes on, about to leave their apartment to get in the car, to drive the 10 to 15 <laughs> miles to the church. So they're not really on their way. Okay, while our on our way might mean I'm on I'm on Jolly about to turn on to a Waverly and be at the church in a minute. Okay. So what is your OMW? So for Jesus, his on my way, he waited two days. And then by the time he got there, Lazarus had been in that tomb for four days. So Lazarus is good and dead. Nobody can say, oh, he was in the tomb pretending to be dead because he sealed up in a cave. Okay. Um, in, in grave clothes, you know, they can't play it off, you know, like, um, oh, he's holding his breath, you know, they didn't have oxygen back then, you know, to pump in or anything. No, he's dead. He's good and dead four days. And so Bethany was near Jerusalem about two miles away. Okay, so this is important because you're dealing with, again, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, the political leaders, all of them in Jerusalem. And then Jesus is about to do this amazing sign, this amazing sign. So then the next part I call 90 day morning because I'm thinking of that show 90 day fiance. Don't watch it, but watch the commercials. But 90 day fiance, but 90 day morning. Because it says, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Well, I had read that, um, you know, we, we have our um, home goings and we have the repast and we might be around the family a little bit before, you know, like if they get in town about a week early, um, especially I see it a lot in the South, people will bring, um, bring food to the family um, and they'll bring, like I said, they'll bring um, soda or pop or water or something, breakfast food, lunch food, dinner food. What do they need? You know, people will drop off flowers as well. They'll talk to them. And that might be for about a week before, maybe two weeks before um, the actual home going service or the funeral. And then after the funeral, there might be uh, some people who are around for a couple of days, you know what I mean? Um, but then everybody kind of disperses. Well, I read in one of my commentaries that um, for them, historically, people could be around for 90 days, 90 days being with you. And so that's kind of nice, but it's also like you still here, <laughs> you know? So 90 day, and some people were professional mourners. That's what they did, you know what I mean? So you had these people all around Martha and Mary, you know, to comfort them concerning their brother. And so then Martha, as soon as she, verse 20, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. 
Now, some people say that Martha was fussing at Jesus. Okay. So, cause she, it all depends on, you know, how, when you read a text and how you put the, um, how you say the words. So if we say the words a certain way, Lord, if you have been here, then it sounds like she's fussing at Jesus. Okay. Or she might've just been stating it as a fact. She might've just been saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I know that you have the power to keep him living. And now he's, he's deceased. She could have been saying it in grief. She could have been saying it crying. Now, the other thing I want you to notice about this is when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went on out there. Mary sitting down. And this so fits these sisters because if, again, if you go back to the time when um, Martha and Mary and Lazarus had Jesus and the disciples in their home and they were, you know, feeding them, Martha was in the kitchen getting the meal ready because they were there for a meal. You know I me. Mean? Now, God had to correct Martha because she got too tied up in serving, too tied up in, in doing that and not really um, listening to Jesus and worshiping Jesus and sitting at his feet. But at that time, she was busy trying to serve. And what was Mary doing? She was sitting at Jesus' feet. Okay. Every time you see Mary, she's sitting down. Okay. But it's not necessarily a bad sitting, but she's sitting. So even here, Martha, she's a go-getter. She's going to go find out. Jesus, where have you been? You know, that's how it kind of comes out, like she's fussing. Well, Mary's sitting in the house. And then people mourn differently, too. And I've learned that. Some people, um, you know, like the, the adrenaline kicks in and they're busy doing stuff. Some people, they go sleep, you know what I mean? Because in their grief, they just sleep, you know what I mean? So you have to realize people might not grieve like you grieve. And so Martha is like a go-getter. She, you know, that adrenaline's running, you know, and then Mary is sitting in the house. But again, remember, Mary's the same person who sat at Jesus' feet and listened to him when they were preparing the dinner. dinner. Mary's the same person that sat at Jesus' feet, anointed his feet, and, and wiped her and dried his feet with her hair, okay? Still at Jesus' feet in humility, still at Jesus' feet, still recognizing Jesus as master, okay? Now, here she's just sitting in the house, but we'll see. She's going to be at Jesus' feet again. So then... So was Martha fussing or was he just stating the fact? But she also said this in the middle. She was like, first she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But then she goes back and she says, well, whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So she, you know, she's trying to hold on to her belief. And I know a lot of times when someone dies, we have to hold on to our, our belief. I, I really clearly heard God ask me when my dad was sick, are you still going to serve and worship me if your dad dies? And I had to make a decision. And I said, yes. And basically within a month, my dad passed away. And that was 20 years ago, come August um, 13th. But Mark 9, 24b says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So sometimes we believe, but then we get these doubts in us. And so there's belief mixed with, there's a dichotomy. There's belief with unbelief, you know? And, and so that's kind of like how Mar Martha was kind of being, you know, she's like, Lord, I know if you had been here, you wouldn't have died, but I also know um, that whatever you ask, you'll give me. And, and, but she's just kind of going through, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief because, you know, I'm still dealing with the fact that my brother died. And so then Jesus needed to correct her theology about something, okay? And sometimes our theology needs to be corrected. Um, and so her correction was that resurrection is more than an event. So Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Then Martha, this is some correct theology, everybody. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she's looking at the event. That is true. Okay. She's looking at it. That event is true that Lazarus will rise again at the resurrection at the last day. We will rise again at the resurrection at the last day. But then Jesus like, no, like your, your theology is limited. Okay, you're, you're thinking that resurrection is just an event. Okay, so then Jesus says in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Because remember, we don't really die. We might fall asleep. Okay, but when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we have eternal life. So eternal doesn't end. <laughs> eternal keeps going. So we have eternal life. And so to be um, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay, we just keep going. It just looks different. Okay, got a different body, different form, 
but we're still living. It's eternal life. And so Jesus had to explain to her, resurrection is more than an event. I am the resurrection. And then when I read this in the key verse, right after that, I thought of more I could say. You all probably said more because he said, I am. And, you know, that's the, that is the name that God uses um, when he's talking to Moses. He says, I am who I am. And so we see in the book of John where Jesus says, I am um, the way, the truth, and the life. I am. So God is the way, the truth, and life. I am the resurrection and the life. Okay. I am um, the bread of life, or I am the bread from heaven. Okay. I am the light of the world. Okay. And so it's another good study to study in John how Jesus talks about I am. Who is he? Okay. So we got the signs. I talked about that today, but I am. And so had to correct the theology, had to make it go further. So she understood resurrection as an event, but we need to understand resurrection as Jesus Christ himself. Okay. He is the resurrection and the life. Okay. So remember, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And we don't come to the father except through Jesus Christ, because he is the resurrection. Then Martha said, she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. So you are the Messiah, the son of God who is coming to the world. So then she makes her statement of belief. And we looked at these verses last week, but they're important enough to keep looking at. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So Martha declared her faith. I believe that you are the Christ. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So Martha believed that Jesus was the Christ, the son of God. She believed that Jesus was the resurrection and the life, okay? So she believed that he it was, that he is, okay? And then he rewards us with eternal life, okay? Now, that part was the lesson. Now we got a part that's not the lesson again, but we got to keep going because it's all the same story. So I call this in the middle of the lesson. So then I call this sitting at Jesus' feet. And I already kind of talked about that. So I'm just going to read these scriptures and we'll just flow a little bit more. And it says, and when, so this is Martha. And when Martha had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her, so the ones, the Jews that were with Mary, because they were people, the mourners, remember, and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly, went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. So they thought she was going to the gravesite to cry. And so as professional mourners, they were going to go and be supportive and be there with her. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, let's look at what she does, everybody. She fell down at his feet. I told you, Mary's good at being at his feet, that humility, saying to him, and then she said the exact thing her sister said, exact thing. She said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And sometimes that's how we feel. We feel like, God, where were you when so-and-so was sick? God, where were you when so-and-so died? And, you know, um, there's a story with, that says that God says, I was the same place when Jesus, when my son Jesus died. I was there. Okay. And so just that idea, she asked that same question because it is grief. It is pain. It does hurt. And it's just like, my brother died. You know what I mean? Somebody you loved and someone I loved. And so she asked that question. But again, she humbled herself and went to his feet and asked him. So then verse 33 says, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. You know, it just got to him. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Then the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. So now you know where it is, even though you knew it was in there. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. So even though Jesus knew the miracle that he was going to do, he still, remember the verse, um, well, I'm going to show you the verse. Romans 12, 15 says, Re rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Jesus still weeped 
with Mary. Jesus still wept with Martha. It still troubled him. It still bothered him. Remember, Jesus is human and divine. So that human part hurt because he loved Lazarus and he knew Lazarus was dead. But the divine part of him, that, div that whole divine man knew, I'm about to um, give God glory because he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead. But I call this part, don't cry, wipe your eyes, he's not dead. There's a song that goes, don't cry, wipe your eyes, he's not dead. It's part of a song that we sing that um, young people actually danced to it years ago um, on Resurrection Sunday. And so it's talking about Jesus. Um, and so it says, um, don't weep, he's fast asleep. He's not dead. That's how the song goes. Okay. And so that idea is Jesus did weep. Okay. He feels what we feel. He's our high priest. Remember the verse I read to you from Hebrews, you know, he sympathizes with us. And so in his sympathy, he wept. Okay. But he also knew, even though he really was dead, he was about to write, he, the miracle's coming. So then, but you got folk. You got folk, you know, we got folk. Verse 37 says, and some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Okay, so when Jesus doesn't meet your expectations, so you have people there that wanted to tell Jesus how he's supposed to do things. Or we want to tell God how he's supposed to do things. You weren't supposed to let this person die. You weren't supposed to let this person get sick. You, I was supposed to get an A in this class. I wasn't going to supposed to be dealing with any trouble. This not wasn't supposed to happen to me. You know, why me? You know, have another folk, but not me. And so even here they're saying, um, this man, what, is he limited in power? You know what I mean? Um, if he opened the eyes of that blind guy, remember we talked about that already. So word had got out that he had opened the eyes of the blind guy. So he's like, if he opened the eyes of that blind guy, why couldn't he stop this guy from dying? Like, oh, is he limited in power? So, you know, sometimes people have expectations. Oh, People who don't know Jesus Christ have expectations on us. Well, you're supposed to do this. Well, you're supposed to do that. Or well, they start questions. Well, why did God do this? And why did God do that? And sometimes they ask questions we can't answer. Remember, this is a walk of faith. We don't know all the answers. We trust God and we go forward in God. But, you know, so you had these naysayers, you had these folk picking. And now we're back to our lesson. So then Jesus, again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Now, what I said on this part is, what part is God asking you to do? Obey him. Now, Jesus could have came to the tomb. He could have commanded the stone to move. The stone could have moved. Remember, Jesus got out of, the, of his grave. He had a rock in front of it, too. Rocks don't stop him. Remember the miracle we talked about already, one of the other signs, he walked on the water. Nature doesn't stop him. So just because there's a big rock doesn't mean he couldn't have moved it. Whether he moved it physically, whether he just spoke to the rock and told it to get out of the way, but he could have moved the rock, but he had them participate in the, in the miracle, in the sign. He had them do a part. He had, remember, faith is an action word. He had them show some action. He said, move the stone, take away the stone. So in your life, you know, um, we say we're waiting on God. And yes, there's times we're supposed to sit and wait and rest in him. But then what are we supposed to do? Because the word wait also means serve. Okay, like waiter, it means serve. So it doesn't mean just sit there and do nothing. <laughs> okay, it means Sometimes which was a rest, okay, physically actually rest, but sometimes we're waiting, but waiting also means serving. And so how are we supposed to serve until God does what he's going to do? Okay, so if he says something for you to do to serve, serve him. He's got your situation. He's handling your situation, but he, he needs you to serve him or he wants you to take part in the miracle by doing what he told you to do and then he'll handle whatever else needs to be done so he said take away the stone so everybody for yourself this is a question you don't have to answer me what part in whatever's going on in your life is God asking you to do and if you haven't done it go do it go do it 
So then Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he has been dead four days. <laughs> In other words, like he's dead four days. Remember, you waited two extra days. This ain't okay. This is gonna smell really, 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 really bad. Okay, so I call this trying to teach God. Now, remember, Jesus knew that the body was gonna stink. You don't have to explain this again, trying to box God in, trying to teach God, trying to explain stuff to God that God already knows. Okay. Um, trying to justify ourselves. Okay. Um, so Martha's trying to teach God. He's trying to teach Jesus saying, this is not going to smell good. We don't need to open this. This doesn't. Okay. I know you love Lazarus, you know, and she might be thinking, I know you want to see him, but he's not going to look good. He's not going to smell good. He's been dead for four days. Um, and this is not a wise thing to do. I'm trying to tell God, you know. Well, Jesus said to her, did I, na did I not say to you that if you would believe you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. So Jesus did not have to pray out loud. He prayed out loud for the people standing around. He already had prayed. He already stayed in communication with God. He already knew the miracle that he was about to perform. Because again, John put these miracles in here, these signs in here to show us, to, to unveil that Jesus was human and divine, that Jesus was showing the glory and power of God through himself. And so this is going to show that Jesus is master over death. Jesus is Lord over death. Jesus has destroyed death. All this, that's what this miracle is. And this is the miracle right before the cross. And so what I call this is truth is greater than, that's a greater than sign for the math folk who don't know. Uh, uh, the truth is greater than fact or truth over fact. We need to believe the truth over facts. We need to realize that truth is greater than facts. So yes, um, Martha was telling him a fact. After four days, the body's going to stink. Okay. But the truth was that Lazarus was, was going to get resurrected from the dead. Um, and we, we see this all through the Bible. You know, we can say that a fact is that um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a unwed teenage mother. She was. Okay, that's the fact. If you just looked at her and you didn't know anything, you'd be like, man, that's an unwed teenage mother. What? You know, and, and back in those days, if you're unwed and you're pregnant, they might stone you to death. Okay. But the truth was, she was a virgin Mary. Okay. That the Holy Spirit had come upon her. And so the child that she was having was the son of God. That's the truth. And we stand in faith with, on that truth. So we need to believe truth over fact and, and, truth that, and truth is greater than fact. And so Jesus said to Martha, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And remember, Jesus is the truth. He says, and remember, we talked about last week from Numbers, the scripture that says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he has to repent. Okay. So when Jesus says something, that settles it. It's a done deal. So then we go to, and God said, and it said good. And then I just wrote good. He said Lazarus name. So the scripture says, now, when he has said these things, he cried with a loud voice. So he got loud, you know, Lazarus come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave cloths, clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. So when they moved the stone, it might have had a stench. Then Jesus called out, Lazarus, come forth. And he came out looking like he had died because he had on grave clothes. He had some um, translations that napkin, they put a napkin over their face. You know, um, there's a napkin over his face. Okay, or cloth over his face. And so he was still tied up like he was dead. And so Jesus had to tell him, he's alive now. Take off those grave clothes off of him. 
he's alive. Those don't, they, those don't fit him anymore. Okay. So I said, and God said, because, you know, we think about in the beginning, um, God created the heavens and the earth, you know what I mean? And, uh, and it says, and, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, and so God speaks things into existence. And so Jesus said, Lazarus come forth. Now I said, it's good that he said Lazarus name and some other commentary said that because if he had just said, come forth, remember they in a graveyard. <laughs> if Jesus just said, come forth, everybody might've came forth, everybody. It'd be like, it'd be like, um, like the walking dead, you know, they we really walking living, but still, you know, everybody would came out of grave because he said, come, because Jesus has power over death and he could have commanded everybody to get out of that grave. And so he was specific. He said, Lazarus come forth. And then Lazarus came up out of that grave. And so then Romans 4, 17, the second part of it says, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. So it looked like Lazarus was dead, but basically he said, you're living, get up, you know? So God can turn around a circumstance. God can turn around a situation. You know, God can um, do the miraculous in our lives. Okay, God does the miraculous in our lives. Sometimes we see things and we don't see them, you know, even if it's an ordinary miracle, but God, you know, what we call an ordinary, what we think ordinary miracle, or we just say, oh, that was lucky. No, we are blessed. <laughs> we are blessed. Um, it was maybe looked like an ordinary miracle to you, but it was still a miracle, you know, life, health, and strength. That's miracle. But he calls those things which be not as though they were. So it was like dead man. He's like live man. <laughs> you know, it's like, let me, let me switch that. Live man, Lazarus come forth. Okay. And so then that's actually the end of the scriptures. But just to understand what this lesson is saying, the word, remember the word? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and Jesus is the living word. But Jesus conquers the last enemy death. That's what we're talking about. So just to um, talk about this a little bit more before I do my summary. When he did this, if you go through the rest, this chapter doesn't end. It, it keeps going even further, but we're not going to go any even further. But word got to the Pharisees and all of them, high priests and all of them, that Jesus raised somebody from the dead. Okay, raised Lazarus from the dead. It's not that they didn't believe it. They believe that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. It bothered them because they thought it was going to cause trouble with the Romans because, you know, it looked like Jesus was in power. And also people were going to start following Jesus and not following them. And so it was power game. So they were upset. And so actually him, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead was the... Um, key, or if you might want to say it was the event, or it was the domino um, that started the whole reaction. Because now, before they were fussing with Jesus, but they weren't doing anything, but then they started plotting his death. Not only did they plot Jesus' death, they planned on killing Lazarus, because they didn't have like that a man that had, was everybody knew was dead was walking around. See, remember, he did this miracle right by Jerusalem. He went way out in a far country so they, that no one would be affected. He's right at Jerusalem. They were going to hear about this all the time. Lazarus was going to be walking around Jerusalem, you know, grocery shopping or whatever. And so this started, this chain reaction from the Pharisees and Sadducees. This started the chain, the high priests and so forth. This started the chain reaction that led to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Because they're like, this man's got to die. Jesus got to die. And we got to kill Lazarus too. Now, Lazarus, as far as we know, didn't get killed. Um, but Jesus, we know, went to the cross. But Jesus showed that he conquers the last enemy death. And ultimately, he did that by, the death on the, by his death on the cross and his resurrection. So just a couple of more scriptures. First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, 13 and 14 says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope, okay? So see how it says sleep? We just fall asleep, you all, but we don't sorrow like those who don't have hope. Verse 14 says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So if we sleep in Jesus, we will rise, with, we will rise again, amen? 
And then 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 23 says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, man lowercase, by man capital M, also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, he's that man with the lower M. Even so in Christ, Christ is the man with the capital M, all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Okay, Jesus conquers the last enemy, death. So last point that I want to share with you, I actually found this in the um, with the word um, commentary by Warren Wearsby. Now it's not a statement from him. It was a statement he quoted. And I love this statement. And I'm putting it as my summary. So it says, if God is at work, week by week, raising men from the dead, there will always be some people coming to see how it is done. I'm going to stop for a minute. When we accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we went from death, so we were dead, to life. So Jesus raised us from the dead. God raised us from the dead. So I'm going to say this again, just so you get the idea. All of us, if you're saved, you've been raised from the dead. So if God is at work week by week, raising men from the dead, there will always be some people coming to see how it is done. You cannot find an empty church that has conversion for its leading feature. Do you want to know how to fill empty chapels? Anybody want to know? Okay, because we a lot of churches are empty after this pandemic. Do we want to know how to fill empty chapels? Here is the answer. Get your Lazarus. This is a quote from Samuel Chadwick, who was a Methodist evangelist and educator between, um, and his lifespan was 1860 to 1932. So again, do you wanna know how to fill empty chapels? Here's the answer. Get your Lazarus. Let us plant, let us water, so that God will provide the increase and those who were dead will be, come back to life because they will have life in Christ Jesus. This is, our, this is our lesson for today. Be blessed, love in Christ, Sister Sharon.